Before we begin the episode, I wanted to just let you all know that I have been away traveling to Ohio with the Teach Better team to work on a plan for a conference that's coming up in 2022. So if you missed it, the Teach Better team went live on Wednesday night to share some details about the Teach Better conference in 2022. And the dates for the conference is actually October 14th and 15th, and the location is going to be in Akron, Ohio, at a STEM school, which we actually got to visit. It's amazing. It's called the NIHF STEM Middle School, and it is a museum that's actually converted into a a charter school, a STEM school, and it's fantastic. And what an amazing venue. I can't wait. And there's going to be some early bird registration dates starting October 27th and going into February and you're going to definitely want to check that out at teachbetter.com as far as the rates for the two-day registration and it's quite a bit off for the early bird special. There was a delay in the recording as far as my schedule just because of that so I do apologize that it's been probably over a week if not almost two but I'm super excited about this episode pumped about the Teach Better conference. I got to go in 2019, and already I can tell that 2022 is going to be even better. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the leadership development podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Heather, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my honor. And before we dive into a lot of really important topics on leadership and student engagement, I would love to hear about your leadership journey. Okay. So when I hear that, part of my brain goes to the formal training and then part of my brain goes to like the informal stuff. So I am the type of person who, let me tell you a story about when I went to my doctor's office for the very first time, I switched general practitioners and hanging on the wall was a sign that said, we value our patients. And they were looking for patients to join this like patient physician board to have dialogue. And I haven't even met my doctor yet. And in my brain, I'm like, oh, I think that might be something that I should think about. I haven't met him yet. So my brain, I tend to be somebody who wants to contribute. And so I started teaching. Teaching was really my backup plan because I wanted to write books, but I didn't know how to be a well-paid famous author overnight. And so teaching was the backup plan. And I was really fortunate because my cooperating teacher, my first cooperating teacher, she showed me that teaching could be awesome. I was an English, uh, I was a student teacher in English. And I was like, wait, I can assign people to read and write about things that I want to read and write about. And so it was, it was kind of fun. But as soon as I started teaching, I realized that I was doing the same thing that the person whose classroom was next to mine, who was about to retire, was doing. The nice part about being a teacher is there is no climbing to the top. And so there's a lot of democracy, you know, in that opportunity. But at the same time, I was in my early 20s and knew that I would have to work for longer than I had been alive. (laughs) So I was like, now's the time to go back to school because Um, I was newly married and didn't have any kids. And so I started to get my administrative certification. And then while I was there, I got my PhD because why not? Um, Why not? Why not? Still no kids at the beginning. And my dissertation was on the impact of leadership preparation Mm -hmm. on leadership practice, because it felt very much like getting the certification to become a leader. In my teacher brain, it felt like a hoop that I had to jump through. Like people just wanted money. And so I just had to pay people money and go to these classes. And, you know, I would get some anointment or something that would allow me to (laughs) be an administrator. And so what I realized through that work was that it's not a hoop you have to jump through. It's a springboard into the next thing because being an administrator requires a different skill set. Like you're doing different work than you're doing as a teacher. It's not like you're the senior teacher or the um, 
associate teacher. I don't know that those terms don't exist, right? It's a different job altogether and working with adults and families and um, in that different way, I think it's really important to get the training in order to do that. But part of that training for sure is being in the classroom, but not that's not enough to be the best leader for the field. Yeah. So Heather, you were an administrator. So was that an assistant principal or a principal? Oh, so I'm an assistant superintendent right now of curriculum instruction and technology. Before that, I was a director of elementary education. And before that, I was a superintendent. Before Most of my jobs have been in the somewhere connected to teaching and learning around curriculum and instruction. But some of my titles have had like it's principal slash or assistant principal slash. And so, you know, I've been in many different trenches. (laughs) It's great because it's different perspectives and you pick up different things along the way. Well, I know a, a large passion of yours is engagement in the classroom and with students. So where did that passion come from? Was that something that was harnessed as a teacher while you were learning your craft? Or was it something where you observed another teacher and saw the techniques and strategies that they were using and brought a passion upon you during that experience? Or what was it about student engagement that really hooked you? So I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know how much I thought about engagement when I was a teacher, at least not in that uh, language. Sure. Um, the While I was going to school for administration, I was also a staff developer um, And where I'm from, there's, it's called a board of cooperative educational services. So I, BOCES, so I was working for BOCES and going into um, schools that were designated as underperforming in ELA. And my job was to help them improve in ELA. Mm -hmm. And one of my coworkers was like, hey, I signed us up for this training. It's Charlotte Danielson come with me. So I was like, okay, I had no idea what I was going to or the impact that that would later have when I became an administrator. So that was my first real conversation into Danielson. And then as an administrator, I got some coaching from a wonderful woman named uh, Dr. Paula Bevan, who worked for um, the Danielson group. I think that's the title of that organization, the Danielson Group. And she used to talk about engagement as brain sweat, like the kids' brain should be sweating because they're doing this thinking and work, which was a contrast to this kind of going in with a um, check off, you know, list of are the students doing this or are the students doing that? And really that was acknowledging compliance, but not necessarily really thinking about engagement. And um, I happened to be at a joint substitute recruitment fair at a different building. So I was going there to recruit subs and I had used the ladies room and they had a poster of Philip Schlechty's uh, levels of engagement on the wall. And that really triggered. So, so all of this was kind of happening all at once, this brain sweat and this levels of engagement, which led me, I thought Schlefti's levels were close, but it didn't exactly scratch the itch that I was having. So the more I thought about it, I I ended up creating what I call an engagement continuum. Hmm. So from left to right, so left is highly disengaged. So that manifests as non-compliance. And then that bumps up to compliance that bumps up to interest, and that bumps up to absorbed. So that's the range of engagement of what that could look like. And um, so I felt really excited about that. But then I was like, but what would cause somebody to move from one level to another? So I ended up taking that linear continuum and bending it pole to pole. So now it's a two by two matrix because I realized that the variable along the bottom is somebody's relationship to the task and the vertical variables are your relationship to the person assigning the task and or the consequence you get for doing the task. Consequence being neutral, so carrot or stick, right? So somebody who is not compliant as an example, so they have a low relationship to the task, bottom left, and they have a low relationship with the person doing or assigning the task 
and to the consequence they get for doing or not doing the task. So non-compliance is, I don't care about this. I don't care about you. And I don't care about what happens if I don't do it, um, which we can all understand and relate to that. Whereas compliance is, People who are compliant don't care any more about the task than people who are not compliant. They care more about the relationship with the person assigning it or the consequence for doing it or not doing it. So it's still, I don't care about this, but grandma asked me to take out her garbage. I will take out the garbage for grandma. Or I don't care about doing this, meaning I wouldn't have done it for free, but now that you're offering me 50 bucks, I'll do it. Or I wouldn't have done it before. Uh, just for the grade, but you're threatening to call my mom. <laughs> now I'll do it. That really, I started to talk about that with people and um, they were like, oh my gosh, that's so great. Uh, where did you read that? I'm like, no, I didn't read that. I created that. They're like, oh, you should write that. I was like, I should write that. <laughs> so that led to my first book, Engagement is Not a Unicorn, it's a Narwhal. Yeah. I love that title, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. It's the concept of it is really that we often think about engagement in really mythical ways, like a unicorn. And what's so interesting about unicorns is that like two-year-olds know what a unicorn is, even though it's not real, they know what it is. But narwhals, which are real, it's, um, you know, a whale that has a tusk coming out of its head. It's a real thing swimming around right now on planet earth. Um, <laughs> Um, not everybody knows what a narwhal is. And even if they do, they're not, they don't realize that it's a real animal yeah. swimming around right now. It's just a fish <laughs> unicorn. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you bring up a topic that I want to poke at a little bit, which is you said that the reward was a grade. And so I want to know the relationship between what your theory was but really what your view of grading is, is it just a piece of compliance or is, you know, as a form of feedback, you know, what, what is your idea of grading and how should that be used in the classroom? Um, I want to preface this by saying that I am not some grading hippie that like wants to, <laughs> wants to, right. <laughs> I think that grades often undermine the thing that we're trying to achieve, which is learning. And we actually teach kids to focus on the grade. Um, and we don't teach kids that grades um, are really supposed to be feedback about the learning. And so we're teaching them to focus on the wrong thing. I heard Handy B. McKay, who wrote the book, You Don't Have to Be Bad to Get Better. She talked about not knowing any um, intellectually lazy four-year-olds. And she chose that age on purpose because that's pre-kindergarten. Yep. And so, you know, as human beings, we're wired to be curious. We're wired to want to learn. That's how we get to walk and talk. And we never get any grades um, in order to accomplish that. Um, we're highly motivated to achieve that. And in fact, not only do we not get grades, but we celebrate approximation. Like nobody yells at a, at a kid who can't walk, who is crawling and trying to walk. We never say, oh, what is wrong with you? Like you obviously, you see me walk, don't you? Don't you know what walking looks like? Come on, go ahead. It's your turn. And if you don't do it, I'm going to, you know, call your mom. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> like, it's just absurd. Yeah. And so I still teach, I teach at a university for aspiring, I teach um, a curriculum course for aspiring administrators, and I will not give uh, my students grades um, I, until they've read my feedback. And so, and how do I know that they've read my feedback? Because they have to respond to my feedback. So I give them feedback and I say, based on this feedback that I've given you and the rubric, what grade do you think that this um, that this response has earned? I ma I make them think about it. Again, it's not that I'm never going to grade them. It's that the grade is the least important piece of information that I can give them, not the most. We definitely can agree upon that. So you are not a hippie by any means. Uh, <laughs> oh, and then the other thing too is that I want to say is, Josh, how many courses did you take on grading? It, either to become a teacher or an administrator. I, I don't remember. Any. Right, because we don't we don't teach people how to grade. No. 
And so we default to the way that we were graded, which is awful and crappy and just past practice. And then we have to combat this tradition of grading that is flawed, fundamentally flawed, as though it is fundamentally sound. And we say things like, oh, parents won't understand or kids won't do their work or things like that. Well, listen, I don't want to do work that um, is disengaging and I don't want to do work that is just busy work, but give me a purpose and, you know, then see what happens. Well, I want to know as the superintendent of curriculum and instruction and technology within your district, I mean, is this a conversation you all are having currently in regards to grading and what it looks like? It's so funny. I was just in the superintendent's office last week and we were talking about this um, because I was lamenting my own children do not go to uh, school where I work. That's intentional. I want them to be assessed and known for who they are, not for who their mom is. Um, And also because I blog and I often (laughs) talk about things and it would be really hard to blog about the things that my kids experience if I have to work with their teachers. So I was lamenting to my superintendent about my children and my daughter, who is an overachiever. She sets the bar as I'm going to get high on a roll at least. So it's a 95% average or better for her. And yet a couple of weeks ago, I was driving her home from her volleyball game. She said, I think I got a 50 today in my Spanish class on the quiz. And so that will bring up my average. I said, bring up your average. And she said, yeah, because I think my test quiz average right now is a 37. And I was like, wait, what? Because I am the mom who goes in every Friday with my kids. I have a sixth grader, an eighth grader, and a 10th grader. And we look at the parent portal. I'm like, what should we celebrate? What are areas that you're working on? You know? I try to have conversations like that. And I had been in there and I, I saw that it was uh, low, but I was like, wait, let me go back and look at this one more time. So her Spanish teacher has 50% for homework and 50% for tests and quizzes. Josh, ask me what her homework average was. If her test quiz average is 50 or less, what's her homework average? I'm going to say high. It is high. So I'm like, how can she have a 95% or whatever homework average, but a 50% or lower test quiz average? What is going on there? Shouldn't these things be correlated? I mean, really, shouldn't they be correlated? So I reached out to the teacher and she said, oh, well, the homework, I just check whether or not they've done it for most of it. And then we go over it in class together. And so they get real time feedback about what they've, what they've done incorrectly and they're able to correct it. Oh, okay. And so, well, clearly teacher, I didn't say this, but clearly it's not transferring in the first place. But then when I hear my daughter and this is one-sided, right? I'm not going to question this teacher in this way. I'll talk about her apparently, but I'm not going (laughs) to question her, but My daughter tells me, like, mom, if we get the accent wrong on one word, she counts the whole sentence wrong. I'm laughing at that because I'm like, she needs to take a walk down the hall to the English teacher's classroom because these kids are native English speakers, have been learning to read and write English their whole school careers. And I'm going to guess, though we don't have accents in English, I'm going to guess they have commas in the wrong place. I'm going to guess that they're misspelling words and things like that. So for them to get it 100% accurate or 100% inaccurate, like that's the grading system. I don't know. It really sucks the life out of me. And so I was talking about this with my superintendent and he was saying, well, at least we're better than that because we have a consistent grading policy for our students across the district. Because I was saying, you know, she could have a different Spanish teacher and her different Spanish teacher in her district because they're all allowed to do that, figure that out by themselves. He's like, at least we're consistent. I'm like, "Eh." I mean, that's better, I suppose, than others. But Our grading policy is if you turn in the work one day late, you get 20% off. So your 100 becomes an 80 and then it becomes a, I don't know what. My issue with that that I was saying to him is I want that grade to be reflective of this knowledge of the standards and the content. The behaviors of learning related to that are irrelevant because when you sit down and take 
the state assessments or whatever. It's nice if you're a nice kid, but if you're a nice kid, it shouldn't count extra. And if you're a jerk, it shouldn't count against you. And certainly something like bringing in tissues to school or, you know, participating in spirit week, uh, those things have nothing to do with the standards and there should therefore should have nothing to do with the grade that a child receives. But what about assigned rubrics? Yeah. Um, <laughs> again, I think some of this is just about there's so much to talk about with changes to standards all the time with now with pandemic stuff with, you know, all kinds of stuff. There's always something to talk about and grading just takes that back seat. And we never get around to having the conversation because it feels to many people like it's working. Yeah, you make some great points. And at my campus and in our district, we're definitely having that, those conversations also about like the behavior component versus the knowledge of the standard. And are we really truly getting the feedback to the students in regards to what their knowledge is? It's more difficult, obviously, than most districts are willing to put in as far as the work, because like you said, it's we're very much into our traditional practices and doing what we've learned in our past. So it's been a pretty interesting couple of years here as far as those conversations go. So I can only imagine what your district's like, too. I mean, it's this is universal stuff. At least we're having the conversations, right? That is very true. And that's that's the main piece is, you know, not everyone agrees upon it. We're having those conversations and and trying to find the best practice for for our students. I think that's the most important thing. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. All right. I want to talk about one other piece. This is an important one because... Across the country, a lot of folks are retiring or they're getting burnt out and they're quitting the profession. And I know that after the pandemic, a lot of districts, and probably you're feeling this just as much as I am, is that there is actually a teacher shortage. So curious on why you think that's occurring. And then is there anything that you're combating at your own district to try and find the best people for your classrooms? So... I will say that I have recently started to tweet about this because I'm like, I want to start a movement, but I can't start a movement by myself. I need help. There is a hashtag teacher shortage and we need to do something about this because I think internally educators recognize it, but I think externally non-educators don't know. So as I started tweeting about it, what triggered that was I'm a member of a regional committee talking about the teacher pipeline. So there are administrators on there and people from higher education and some people from, I spoke about BOCES earlier. So anyway, we have several people who are on this committee and we've been talking about pipeline, 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 meaning not enough people entering the teaching profession. And so I was tweeting and one of the pieces of feedback that I got was, this is not just that we don't have enough people entering. This is also that we have so many people leaving. And so my dad used to talk about this with money. He'd say, you know, Heather, if the drain in the bathtub is letting out more water than the faucet in the bathtub is putting in, you're never going to have enough water in the tub because you really have two issues, right? You have the drain issue and you have the faucet issue. Um, And so I think the drain issue, meaning people leaving is because people are exhausted and they feel underappreciated and they feel under resourced in order to do what they need to do. And because there aren't enough people like subs, I don't know what the substitute situation looks like where you are, Josh, but where I am, like, I don't know, we're turning over rocks and like, do you have a pulse? So when you don't have enough subs, but you have people who need to take time for whatever reason, and or you have training that you want to do with people during the workday and all kinds of stuff. So you're overtaxing an overtaxed population of people who are there, which only creates more burnout. It's this vicious cycle. And on the other end of it, the faucet issue I'm going to call it way back. I'm going to go retro, but I'm only talking about like race to the top. So I'm talking like 2009, 10, 
when the Common Core Learning Standards came out, I think teachers did a really good job of telling people how undervalued teaching is and, you know, uh, micromanaged they are. And where I am in New York, at that same time, not just in New York, but across the country, you had the recession happening. And so there were a lot of cuts to education. And so there were a lot of layoffs. And so we had people who were coming into the teaching profession who wanted to work in New York, who couldn't get a job in New York. And so they needed a backup plan to become a teacher. When I became a teacher, I was able to have, teaching was able to be my backup plan. The pendulum always swings. And so at the time, teaching was my backup plan before I became a writer. I ended up loving teaching. And so writing became, you know, the thing I did on on the side. But, you know, when you're telling people teaching is undervalued, deprofessionalized, micromanaged, you're not going to get a job anyway. Let's not be surprised when you don't have people rushing to become teachers. And the last thing that I'll say to this is where are the unions and in putting money in advertising for teachers, because I know that I can turn on the TV and see a commercial, not from a specific hospital or a specific nursing program, but I can see uh, commercials, billboards saying that there is a nursing shortage and people know about it. Where is that advertising, not from a specific university, not from a specific school district, but from state level uh, unions, uh, departments of education, and so forth, to, to let people know, if you want to be a teacher, you're going to have a job, especially with certain uh, fields, math, science, because why would you become a teacher if you get, are smart enough to teach math and science? You are smart enough to be better gainfully employed, likely, than you would be as a teacher. However, there are So what are then the advantages of teaching? I think there are plenty. um, And we just need to do a good job advertising that, letting people know. But like you said, we also need to add resources. We also need to pay teachers more than they're making right now. I mean, there's other components to that too that we can do for those who are in the profession currently. 100%. Because how, I mean, I was having a conversation with our teacher union president. We have a high school technology position. Um, It is unfilled this year. We managed to get by this year with it being unfilled, but so we need to fill it for next year. I don't know how we're going to fill it. In New York State, there are two, two colleges that offer um, a technology teaching certification, two. That's it. And so each of those programs has about four students for the whole state. And so if somebody wants to teach technology in New York State, you are going to get hired. And so I was talking to somebody um, and they said that the students in the program have been, they're not even, uh, they haven't graduated yet, but they've gotten job offers already with bonuses. And so how are we going to, how do you reconcile that this teacher who's been in the trenches sweating their butt off, you know, to keep everything afloat, where is like their hazard pay or longevity pay or like senior teacher status or something? Yeah. Or someone that's been teaching for 15, 20 years. And then the person that comes in as a first year teacher is making almost as much as they are. Right. It's, it's insulting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not to, not to digress into a whole different topic, but (laughs) (laughs) There's several things that need to be done for both bringing folks into the profession, but then also retaining the ones that we currently have. The challenge right now is when there's such a shortage, unfortunately, not everybody who enters, who wants to be in the profession, any profession, right, teaching or otherwise is going to be as amazing as we need them to be. But we, since you don't have a good bench to tap into, you end up putting in, you know, your B-level players when you need A-level players. All right. I don't know how to transition over to this, but I know that you have another (laughs) book that I want to talk about, which is the big book of engagement strategies. And we already talked about your first book, which was Engagement is Not a Unicorn. It's a Norwal. Let's talk about the second book though. So what is the big book of engagement strategies all about? 
So engagement is not a unicorn, it's a narwhal, is divided into three sections. Um, what, so what, and now what related to engagement. Yep. So the what section talks about the four levels of engagement. The so what section talks about why those are uh, important. And then the now what section are strategies to help go from one level of engagement to another level. So how do you get somebody from non-compliant to compliant, from compliant to interested and interested to absorbed? Um, the big book of engagement strategies is just engagement strategies divided in those sections. And so it is um, a whale of a book, wink, wink. Um, <laughs> but it has strategies in there, over 50 of them. There are um, 15 different educators who contributed um, to the book. So they are, you know, not just, oh, this is something I found on, uh, you know, in highlights magazine while waiting in the doctor's office, <laughs> but tested and tried strategies for teachers um, who might be looking for some ways to build engagement in their classroom. Very cool. All right. So Heather, I've got another question for you that is going to be very different than about your books, but on a topic we already discussed at the very beginning, which was uh, on leadership. You know, this mm -hmm. was created for not only current leaders, but for aspiring leaders. So if you were to give a piece of advice for someone to maybe complete tomorrow or next week, what would be something that's something of value for them to enhance their leadership journey? I think, and this is a task that I actually have my students do, um, who I teach, um, interview a, a current administrator and ask them about their job. Uh, that to me is the best advice because you, you don't always know from the sidelines what that person, what that job is all about. And in fact, I would interview people with different titles because I think some people think, oh, I, I don't, it's not that they think they don't know. They think they don't want to do the work of this person or that person. And for example, some people are like, oh, no, I wouldn't want to work in district office. It's too removed from kids. I'm not to that. I say, if you let it be that way, yeah. sure. Um, but there are definitely ways to still be connected to kids. Or I also think that um, I talk about people like you, like an assistant principal as a firefighter. And so you need to have a specific skill set of being very um, flexible and um, and have great interpersonal skills and time management skills. I have great interpersonal skills. I have great time management skills, but I do not like putting out fires. I like long-term strategic thinking and planning. And so when I look at my calendar, even if it's packed full of meetings, that's my happy place because I know what I'm going to get done for the day. Your, your calendar and my calendar, I mean, if you have anything on your calendar, I'd be surprised because you have to be at the ready. Yeah. Um, and so you fight fires. I am a fire prevention specialist. I talk about how can we create conditions so that fires may not happen or that they can be a controlled burn. So I like the analogy. Yeah, I think of it as triage. <laughs> yes. And then I have plenty of things on my calendars, the to-do list that I have yeah. to like kind of let go of. If, if I think I'm going to get everything on my to-do list completed, then I'm going to be sorely disappointed. Yeah, right. Because of all the interruptions. But I love that that is a piece of advice because that's very true. I think, you know, regardless of the title, you know, just interview a bunch of leaders because everything is a little bit different. Every school is different. Every district is different. I know, you know, the assistant superintendent of curriculum, instruction, and technology in your district can look very, very different than the one next door. Yeah. And I guess then the, the second piece of advice, not that you asked for two, you asked for one, but <laughs> that's right. <laughs> My bonus advice is don't be so hungry for the administrative position that you'll take the first offer, even if it's not a good fit. Yeah. You need to interview the district um, and make sure that it's a good fit. So for example, if you are wanting to be a principal, most people don't start their journey as principal, they start as an assistant principal. And so make sure that if you're going to, if you aspire to be in a, a principal and you have a position that you're interviewing for as an assistant principal, that you understand if whether or not that person who you're going to be working with is going to help 
um, prepare you for your next step? Or are they somebody who wants you just to be there to do the dirty work and the heavy lifting and you're not really preparing, you're not getting prepared for the next step. Um, so make sure that you, you have a sense of what you're getting into and don't just say yes, because you want the job. You need to want the, to work with those people for that job. So for our listeners, how may they connect with you on social media? I'm pretty active on Twitter. So um, you can follow me at Lions Letters, L-Y-O-N-S-L-E-T-T-E-R-S. So find me there. I'm also on LinkedIn and uh, Instagram. I don't. On Instagram, you're mostly going to see my kids. <laughs> and then I have a blog called uh, Lions Letters. So www.lyonsletters.com. And I put out a blog post every week during the school year. It's really about being in education. And often it's a, I use my kids or family <laughs> as, as my vehicle for the metaphor for the learning because like I said active mom of three kids definitely check out Heather on her social media outlets we'll have those in the show notes including her website for her blog and then also links to her two amazing books make sure you check those out Heather it has been so much fun to have you on the podcast thank you so much for providing so much wisdom today thanks so much for having me it was a great time